Well, yeah, I mean, tourism and hospitality is a huge topic, so I'm just going to be scratching the surface and I'll, I'll, I'll try to go in some of the areas that basically interest me and then we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I have pre prepared a little presentation that I'm going to share my screen with. Let me make you co-host. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, can you see that? Okay, cool. Well, um, just to start with, I mean, basically, I mean, we are all kind of tourists in some sort uh, during our lives. I mean, I think we all kind of part of the privileged uh, part of the population, uh, world's population that can extensively travel. So we are, we are tourists uh, pretty much throughout our lives. And uh, um, I just want to give a, a very few comments on the keywords of the title of this presentation to kind of frame things a little bit. Um, I mean, the tourism industry in general is, is a bit of a specific industry. I mean, it's, it's a very fragmented industry, like 95% of the tourism businesses are small, medium enterprises. Um, it's a notoriously low wage uh, industry and also very low education. But on the other hand, it has a very high uh, impact on the local ecosystems, on the economy, on the well-being of people and on nature. But at the same time, it's also at the intersection of a lot of other industries. I mean, just thinking of transportation, construction, um, agriculture, gastronomy, et cetera, et cetera. So tourism has a very high uh, role as a, as a catalyst. Um, at the same time, tourism is also very big. I think it employs around like 300 million people around the world. It's like the 10th biggest uh, industry sector. And it's also the fastest growing one. So we really have to look at that growth when we speak of uh, sustainability, but we're going to get to that later. Um, so the role of hospitality, I mean, it's been one of the oldest trades, probably. Um, so people always had that role of hosting people, which I think is a very beautiful, uh, beautiful thing to do, because you really get the uh, opportunity to inspire people, to create experiences for them and really kind of, you know, welcome them at your place, which is a bit of a quality which got a bit lost, um, well, in the whole commercialization of tourism and uh, hospitality in general. Um, as with regeneration, uh, for me, um, tourism is a very much ecosystem-based uh, uh, thing because it's all very multi-stakeholder, uh, especially including nature. So you really have to deal with a lot of different stakeholders when you speak of tourism. Um, as we also speaking of paradigm, obviously a paradigm concerns all of society, not just one industry. And so many things that we're going to be discussing here really apply to the society at large, because you can't really see tourism as an isolated entity when you speak of, you know, societal regeneration and then paradigms. Um, so I just want to start a little bit to kind of frame a little bit my version of regeneration compared to sustainability, because I think it's important to really see what the key differences are, because they make a big difference in the way we apply things. Um, so just to go through that very quickly, I mean, so for me, regeneration on a technical level is really about being net positive, focusing on the nature. Uh, it involves systemic thinking. It's all about social innovation. And you always work with a local bottom-up solution. And it's very important to have uh, positive narratives of potential and possibilities to really get the message uh, across. And for me, this also involves a bit the end of mass tourism and meaningful travel experiences. And you know, compared to sustainability, I mean, we don't have to go through all of those, but uh, it's obviously the, pretty much the opposite of regeneration. And yeah, applied to tourism, it really kind of focuses, you know, on kind of banning the plastic straws and reusing towels, kind of the, the superficial solutions in a way. So for me, regeneration is really a new worldview, whereas sustainability is basically a band-aid. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce you to this uh, um, model or this framework that I usually use when I work with, with, with clients. Um, so for me, in the beginning is always really important to make people understand that we're talking about a new paradigm, because if we don't really get that, then we just kind of run the risk of repeating the same mistakes as we did before. So this is really a new thing and people really have to understand that. So we have to question the status quo, rethink business and yeah, work with a systems thinking mindset. Um, once you have that kind of understood, it's really important to understand that this only works with co-creation, collaboration. Um, all the stakeholders have to collaborate 
Um, when you have a tourism or hospitality business, you really have to involve your staff. It's about empowerment of the staff. Uh, you have to involve the local community and also your clients. So everybody kind of has to co-create that new regenerative paradigm. Um, when you kind of have that in place, then you can really start reinventing things. And for me, the reinventing is really based on focusing on quality over quantity, um, our relationship with nature and redefining purpose. So these are kind of the three main conditions to um, start then really applying things. Uh, as with regeneration, it's all kind of place bound. I mean, so the setting is really important. So you really have to kind of rediscover the importance of place, uh, meaning to connect with the local ecosystem, its culture, its values, the nature and the people to really see what are their needs. Because like we said before, it's kind of you know local bottom-up solutions, not top-down solutions. So once you have these things in place, you are working with an actual space, then you can look at what kind of services do you actually want to provide or work with that are kind of I kind of you know, how you say uh, uh, promoting the regenerative um, mindset. So there, it's all about, according to me, about creating ex inspiring experiences that are authentic and nourishing. Um, you have to really pay attention to the changing needs of the the the, the consumers. Um, what about the new trends and the emergence uh, of trends and how to kind of uh, include them in your service offering? And out of that, you create your positioning. And I think you can only have an authentic um, positioning in, in the whole regenerative space if it's really focusing on embodiment and trust, that you're really embodying what you're actually uh, preaching. Um, now having a quick look at how the industry is actually um, picking up the whole regenerative trend. So I just want to pick up a, an article of uh, EHL, that's the Hotel School Lausanne, which is kind of the, the leading hotel school in, in the world. Um, they came up with this article uh, recently and they identified these four key points and what for them is relevant in the regenerative hospitality. Um, I agree to all these four points. I mean, I've also been contributing to the article, but for me, then the real question starts after that. So for me, the real question is, well, how do we actually change mindsets? I mean, adopting a right mindset is something which sounds very easy, but as we know, um, the human being, human psychology is not so easy to change. So how do we actually change the mindsets? Uh, how do we engage the guests and other stakeholders in our endeavors to create a regenerative uh, paradigm? And last but not least, and probably the most difficult, because that's what we're often struggling with, is how to build these new business models. How do we build ecosystems that uh, are actually taking place in a hostile environment? And when I mean a hostile environment, that's basically an environment which is not really favorable to regeneration. I mean, we're still very much kind of, you know, uh, bottom line driven. And uh, all we do with regeneration doesn't mean that we can't make money with it but it just follows a different uh, uh, way of thinking. And this is sometimes not easy to get across and to really install in a, in a new ecosystem. Um, so when we speak about um, those difficulties, for me, when I kind of you know hear the whole um, discussion uh, on sustainability, where we stand in the world, sometimes I really wonder, well, we're just not addressing the elephants in the room. And so you see the poor elephant lying on the, the psychiatrist's couch because he's not feeling acknowledged. Um, so when I say we have to face reality, I think it's kind of the inconvenient truth, which for me in general mean that sustainability doesn't work, that our society, our societal model is self-destructive. Um, quantitative growth is a dead end, and there's only two choices, either forced or voluntary degrowth. Um, so if you apply this to tourism, obviously, I don't think you can make an industry which is relying so heavily on transportation, construction, and very often, let's say, meat consumption to make this sustainable, especially with the growth rates that we're forecasting for tourism. Like I said in the beginning, tourism is the fastest growing industry in the planet with the growth rates of uh, five to 6%. So we already have over tourism and we're gonna keep on growing. So it cannot be sustainable. So we have to kind of let go of that idea. Um, so the tourism model in itself is destructive. Um, the quantitative growth 
is not going to work out. We're going to destroy all the, 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 the ecosystems if we keep on going like that. So we've seen that uh, forced degrowth is something like that happened during the, the pandemic. I mean, if one day to the other, there was no more international flights. Um, that's a way of, of degrowth, which obviously halts tourism, but it was not a, a very pleasant experience. But I think people got used to it rather quickly. Um, if we don't do that, um, I don't think people are going to stop traveling on their own. I mean, the consumer is not going to give up a privilege that he has. And especially there's a lot of people who still want to experience that privilege, which they never had in their lives. And a lot of people traveling is a status symbol. So I don't think it's going to happen voluntarily. So we have to deal with that. So when you ask yourself the question, well, what to do? Um, that's the famous uh, quote from Buckminster Fuller. Um, in the beginning, when I was kind of uh, engaging in this whole regenerative uh, topic in, in, in tourism and hospitality, I was writing all this kind of uh, idealistic articles and uh, I was trying to, you know, believing that I could change the whole industry. But um, I've kind of moved away from that approach a little bit and I'm <laughs> focusing uh, on a bit of a different approach right now, which has much more to do with that kind of quote, because you can only change things if you try to put out a model which is actually inspiring and then inspires people to actually adopt a different way of behavior and, and doing things differently. So then how this regenerative journey is going to look like? As we know, systemic change is very complex and it can't really be planned, or it really, at least it can't be planned in the typical linear approach that we used to have in the current paradigm. Um, so for me, it's all about the transition process that we have to create desirable future scenarios, um, put out the, the right tools, frameworks, and processes on how to actually uh, go on that journey, but also put out the right incentives and regulations to actually be able to make that uh, transition. Um, we have to build resilient uh, ecosystems, tourism ecosystems, where the value creation really stays on site. Um, we have to foster circular societies, and I'm saying especially a circular societies, not just circular economies, because we have to also think in the, the service, in terms of services. And it really focuses on the stakeholder collaboration, because in tourism or as a hospitality business, you're always dependent on a lot of different stakeholders. If you manage to put these people together, then you really have the power to change things. And in the end, I believe it's really important to create prototypes, places where you can actually experience this new narrative, where you can get inspired and where you can hope to people. I think it has a lot to do with hope because a lot of people are kind of despairing nowadays. And if we can give people hope again, that this can be done um, with a prototype that is functioning, that is inspiring, that would be a really cool thing, which has a lot of impact. Um, so these kind of prototypes that I see are kind of these uh, mixed use projects and villages, the stuff that we all kind of working on. And if you're walking, uh, if you do if building prototypes, in the end, it's all about walking the talk. I mean, you have to be authentic and really create a model which is, let's say, where you stick to the kind of guidelines of regeneration, where you really try to make a make a difference. Um, speaking of prototypes, I just want to mention very briefly what Annie already mentioned in the beginning. Uh, something that I'm working on in, in Switzerland, it's a project called Zukunft Bahnhof, which means future train station because it's close to a train station. Um, what we're doing there, it's like a, a hybrid mixed use concept where we combine uh, living, hospitality, uh, culture, gastronomy, and education. And we really want to design a model for regenerative placemaking with that project. Uh, the business model is mainly based on our housing co-op. Um, and the idea is that we really want to kind of offer transformative learning experiences on site. And for that, we actually curate uh, content. So we can have one entity of the business, which is going to be curating uh, events and gatherings and um, similar things that we can really attract people and show them how this thing works. Um, we're currently in the cons in the early architectural stages and we are hoping to open in spring 27. So that was actually it. I think there should be one more slide, but somehow I can't get to it. I don't know. 
I can't continue the, the presentation, but I'll stop it here. So I think I've been very um, quick. So we have time for Q and A's now. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, yes, inspiring. So I think we have about 10 minutes for questions and I invite everyone to raise their hand if you have any questions related. Oh, we got Robert. You can unmute yourself. Thanks, Martin. That was very uh, inspiring. And um, I really love how you sort of try to make some things visible, like the elephants in the room, and that they're not acknowledged or he on the, on the sofa of the psychiatrist. That's very funny. Um, so I, maybe I'm going out uh, on a limp a little bit because one of the elephants in the room is also fighting symptoms and root causes. I think you refer to it also. Um, so I have a sort of a philosophical question or reflection because currently in our, uh, in our uh, economic and social models, we, we have a lot of stress, right? Uh, there's competition, there's profit based uh, matrices. So would you say uh, that because of this stress factor that people are so, sort of more driven into um, uh, hospitality or uh, tourism to sort of counterbalance things? And would you also state that if we sort of shift towards collaboration and a better life balance, that this hunger for bigger tourism might become smaller even. Um, is, I, I sense some intuitive correlation there. Maybe you want to reflect on it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks, Robert, and good to see you again. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, tourism is only growing as quickly because it's it's a way of escaping the, the everyday grind. I think it's, it's seen as a reward. Uh, to get away from what you are doing every day, which you probably don't um, enjoy that much. And uh, also the, the, the status of traveling is, is, is very high, especially in certain countries. And uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a reward that you give yourself for the kind of the hard work you're putting in every day. And, um, but, but uh, like you said as well, I mean, from the, the philosophical uh, approach, I think there could be a big shift in the behavior of people once we start to have um, different ways of, of of traveling, different experiences on site. I mean, that would also kind of, I believe, lead to longer stays instead of you know flying the weekend to Barcelona. Maybe you go uh, one week on a trip or two weeks on a trip where you can actually really engage with the local ecosystem, which is more more uh, sustainable and more nourishing in in a way of a travel experience. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, if it's okay as a short follow-up question, if, unless somebody else has a question. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this, the, uh, the regenerative journey, you know, uh, it like five years ago, everybody wanted to buy a Tesla because this was sort of, you are showing that you are uh, responsible, you care for uh, our, our nature, our, our planet and climate and so on. Do you foresee something like uh, a trend like this or that people only book regenerative journeys or like a sort of certificate? Or, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously that the whole sustainability thing has slowly hit uh, tourism and hospitality maybe like, you know, five years ago. I mean, when I was still actively in the hospitality industry like nine, ten years ago, this wasn't even a topic. And now it's kind of slowly coming, you know, there's a lot of certifications coming up. There's a lot of greenwashing happening. And it's, it's still kind of shocking to see that if certain businesses speak of sustainability, for them, the topic is limited to kind of replacing the plastic, uh, plastic straws, things like that. But yeah, I mean, at the end, it's a beginning. I mean, sustainability kind of came to the world maybe like 40 years ago. And now let's see how long it took us to get where we are. So I see it as a big trend, but it will take a lot to change, um, you know, human behavior at large. So, Thank you. There's one question in the chat, Alex. I don't know if you want to. Uh, yeah, is, do you collaborate with the slow travel movement? I think it's related to certifications and... Um, 
I mean, I, I know of all these uh, organizations, these movements and, and, and these trends. I mean, I don't really collaborate very actively with, with anybody in terms of alliances and then partnerships, but let's say we all kind of know each other and we're kind of working in the, in the same, same direction. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, labels out there and people trying to, you know, do good, but obviously make, make, make money with it. And uh, I mean, the whole slow travel movement has been around for, for a while. I don't even know if they really have like a organization uh, called like that, but I think regeneration has a lot to do with slowness. I mean, slowing, enjoying the quality of life, the quality of travel. And uh, yeah. so, I mean, these are all kind of great initiatives. Yeah. Could I ask uh, something, Annie? Yes, Martin, hi. Hi. <laughs> Good, to see you again. Good to see you again as well. Um, you had on your slide uh, about the Bahnhof um, this term regenerative placemaking. Could you speak to that? What is that, and what like what does that entail? Could you could you, could you unpack it a little bit? Well, it's it's a good question. I mean, I mean, placemaking in general is like a term on on how to develop a certain area. I mean, because what we're doing there is not we're just not developing um, a property, but we are focusing more on the whole area as well. I mean, even though we're not developing that land, we're still involved in the 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 the, the planning process of the other stakeholders who are living there, uh, and we're just kind of trying to bring in our way of thinking into their ways of working and kind of you know spread our influence a little bit i mean we don't have the power to change what they're doing because we only have the influence on our on our land but we're just kind of trying to inspire them to be let's say you know good neighbors and uh, get inspired from from what we're doing and we're trying to be good neighbors to them of course so <laughs> Right, so more than things that you're doing, it's almost it's more like a way of seeing, just to see the nested, contextualized, like the relationships that everything has there. You think? Yeah, ex exactly. And I mean, of course, we have a master plan for, let's say, the, the bigger area, and we will mm -hmm. see where that will lead us at, at, at some point. But the way we engage with all the neighbors, I mean, they will kind of become part of our projects, and we will maybe become part of their future projects. So that's a little bit, let's say, the you know the collaborative, participatory uh, approach that we have. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I had one question actually, like when you're talking about collaboration, because I think uh, that was one of right one of the key points of like collaboration. And at some point, you mentioned collaborating with employees. How do you empower employees? How do you make them really part of it if they don't have like a real, like if they don't have like, a, if they're not like stakeholders in a way that they have equity or, you know, like how do mm. you empower them? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it also starts with them really understanding what it's all about. And I think if somebody, I mean, obviously that in, involves a lot of education, it, it involves a, a lot of, of caring for people and kind of building their desire to, to uh, also create a better world, but also giving them the tools to actually be actively involved and have uh, have their own impact. So I mean, the more empowerment you give to people, the more freedom that they can, you know, bring in ideas or actually proactively uh, do things. It also makes them more interested in what you're actually doing. But if you're as a business have, let's say, a regenerative strategy, but your employees don't believe in it, it's not going to be authentic because I mean, your employees are always the first ambassadors you have of a business. So. I mean, if they kind of, you know, do the recycling at the hotel because they have to, but then they leave the, the hotel and just throw things in the street, that's not going to be a, a very good uh, application of, of your, you know, regenerative uh, philosophy. But I think at the end, it has a lot to do with, you know, education and, and, and just uh, walking the talk and, uh, and everybody's trying to do the best they can. Yeah? Another elephant in the room. Uh, if I think we could take one more question just because we have a break after this session. So if there's one more question, we'll give it a voice. Maybe the dog. <laughs> uh, I'll ask my question. Alex. Um, do you also, to what extent do you try to educate people on what's wrong on the current in the current traveling industry, for instance, things like 
uh, no tax on aviation fuel, uh, bollocks types of CO2 composition, all these kind of things. Well, I think you have to be careful when you tell things wrong, but in the end, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, for people to understand the differences of a new paradigm, you have to show the flaws of the old system. I mean, you have to do it in a, in a, in a, you know, kind of in a, in a good way. But once people understand the dynamics of the current system and the wrong incentive systems that we have, then it becomes more obvious for them why we should change to a new system. Does that answer your question, Alex? Yeah, I was wondering, do, do you, are these the topics that you also educate people on or, or can you elaborate on how you, uh, what, what are your points, your frequent points that you'd like to address? Yeah, well, I think it depends whether the people want to be educated on it or not. So I think uh, if, if you work, let's say, as a consultant, you always have to be a little bit careful on what you can tell the people and what they're ready to hear. But uh, I think if you do it diplomatically, I mean, I, I usually try to show up some of the, the usually the wrong incentive systems that we have, why things don't really change uh, how they could. But you have to be really kind of, you know, let's say diplomatic about that. But, you know, I, I usually try to uh, bring these things in, maybe not, let's say, in the in the official context of the, the consultation, uh, consultation, but then maybe, you know, over lunch, over dinner, uh, after work, you know, these are kind of things that you can, can bring in, in into the conversation for sure, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone that joined the session. Thank you, Martin. This was great. Okay. Great to have you again. And you. see you Thanks. after the short break. Thanks, Bye, guys. everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.